Hello everyone, welcome to Beaver's Hobby Channel. This is a review of Radio Master MT12 Surface Transmitter with HTX Operating System Express LRS version. Before we begin, I would like to thank Banggood for sending me this transmitter for review and tutorials. I have done two tutorials before this, so feel free to check them out. The links are in the description below. Now, let's get on with the show. This is the first production surface transmitter that uses HTX, which is an open source operating system for transmitters. HTX begins its life in air transmitters, but this is not the first time someone uses it for surface vehicles. I have also used it before on my TX16S. It is undoubtedly a very powerful operating system, but let's pause this for now and I'll talk about it later. I'm going to divide this review into three sections. First, the hardware of the MT12 transmitter. Then, we'll take a look at the HTX for car applications. And finally, we'll take a look at the Express LRS protocol, which is the version that I have. As you may have noticed, it, this transmitter has different versions. And when you look at the listing, there are many options to choose from. Here's what they mean. First, FCC and LBT. These are the radio spectrum regulations. FCC is the standard in most countries. LBT is for the EU. In practice, the difference is FCC will have longer range than the LBT because it has a higher output. But actually, if you only drive your car within the line of sight, you'll never run out of the range anyway. So, you choose this option according to your location. By the way, this is limited by the software, so you can get anything and flash the modules to change the version later if you need to. Next one is 4-in-1 multi-protocol and Express LRS. This is the internal module of the transmitter. The 4-in-1 multi-protocol version, as the name suggests, it supports many protocols or receivers. For example, you can bind it directly to FlySky AFHDS, AFHDS 2A, Radiolink and Dumbo RC receivers. You can also bind it to WL Toys cars, Mini Z cars with FHSS and FHS protocols. It also works with SNT micro FPV cars, but ironically, it doesn't work with the turbo racing cars, including the one that being sold on Radio Master website. You can follow the link in the description to see all the available protocols. This version comes with a 5 channel receiver, the R85C. It's a receiver with FreeSky D8, D16, and Futaba S FHSS protocol. The Express LRS version, or ELRS, is an open source project. It boasts high-performance radio control link with ultra-low latency, so you can have a quick response and long range. This version comes with a 3-channel receiver. Basically, they support different protocols, but you actually have the option to do both on the same transmitter. I'll talk about this later. Now that we know all the differences between versions, let's take a look at the package. What I have here is the Express LRS version with LBT system. It comes in a carrying case. There's a quick start manual and a sticker sheet in the box too. The inside has the slot cut out for the transmitter, so it is very well protected. Here's the transmitter. We'll take a closer look at it later. There's also the back of the case with an accessories box. Inside, there's a wrist strap, a module bay for nano radio module, two expansion bases. One is the switches, the other one is the joystick, and the ER3CI receiver. This is an antenna less receiver. It has an internal antenna, so you don't have to worry about what to do with the dangling antenna wire. To be honest, this feels like I have been cheated because the multi-protocol version comes with the 5-channel receiver. Also, the 5-channel version of this is not that much more expensive, nor much bigger than the 3-channel version. I know, because I bought it too. I don't see a reason why they don't give us the 5-channel version. And finally, we have a charging cable and a screen protector. Let's take a closer look at the transmitter. The overall design is heavily inspired by Futaba 10PX with the long trim switches and such. So of course, it is really comfortable to hold. However, the quality is not the best. 
The plastic is pretty good. I would say it's on par with an old Futaba. Definitely better than Radio Link, but still not as good as the Flysky NB4. There are sharp edges on the grip. And very sharp angles on the SC button, where you can really hurt yourself if you are not careful. The button layout is standard Radio Master, and it works really well with HTX. It's also intuitive to use. This key is for the system. MDL is for the model settings. Page left or right, change the pages. And the scroll wheel with button is to change and confirm the value. At the lower left, there's a back button to exit out of the menu. The tele button for telemetry only works on the main screen though. The throttle tension and position are adjustable. As well as the wheel tension. This is the first pistol grip transmitter ever to have Hall Effect sensor on the wheel and the trigger. But why is this important? Because it is a non-contact sensor, meaning there's nothing rubbing against each other inside to get the reading, unlike in a potentiometer that is normally used in this application. To put it simply, this sensor will never wear out, and you'll never have the jittering throttle or steering when it gets old. However, that's a misconception that I need to talk about. This sensor will not help with the so-called joystick drift. You might notice when a transmitter gets old, once you let go of the trigger, or the wheel, or an analog stick of a game controller for that matter, it doesn't return exactly to the center. This is because the plastic stopper wears out over time. A Hall Effect sensor will not fix this. If your throttle or steering body wears out, you'll still have to replace or fix the stopper. Personally, this is why I'm skeptical when a game controller company claims that their controller has no drift. Yes, sure, the sensor can go bad or wear out quickly and the Hall Effect stick will fix this. But what's gonna happen when a drift or when a character walks on their own comes from the worn out stopping mechanism? It only happened to me once with my Xbox 360 controller that I've been using for 13 years. And all I had to do to keep using it was just going into the game settings and increase the dead zone. Anyway, the main thing that you are going to get from the Hall Effect sensor is the precision. Alright, the round is over. Let's get to the next topic. On to the programmable inputs. It has 5 trim switches. Two knobs, which are potentiometers. One three position switch. And three push buttons. You can assign these to do anything, whether it is to control a channel or a value like Jurace or EPA. This is in one of the tutorials that I did, so feel free to check it out. At the top, you can connect the module bay for nano module. So for example, if you have the ELRS version, you can install the multi-protocol module and vice versa. This way you can have anything you want all in one transmitter. It is also future-proof, because you can just install a new module to upgrade it. Here I have my old 4-in-1 module, I can still use it with this transmitter by using another adapter to convert the JR pins to Nano. It also supports PPM, so if you still have that Mini-Z ASF RF board or module, you can use it with this transmitter too. Inside this flap, you'll find a USB Type-C port. This is for connecting to a computer, whether to transfer the files, or you can use it as a joystick. Here's a headphone jack, a trainer jack, and a micro SD card slot. It doesn't come with a battery, so you'll have to provide your own. It takes two 18650 batteries or 2S LiPo. The 18650 is easy to find these days, so uh, that should be no problem. And you'll find another USB port here, it is for charging. The weight and runtime depend on the battery you use. I have 2200mAh battery in this, and I got about 7 hours. 
There is an expansion slot at the base that you can install extra switches or joystick that I showed you earlier. Just remove the battery tray. Pull the cover out. Install the expansion module. And plug it from the inside. It can control up to two inputs. The joystick only takes two axes and not the button. There's also RGB lighting. Surprisingly, it is not a useless gimmick because you can program it to do anything. For example, you can show the battery level with colors. It also has a foldable antenna at the front and you can turn it up for better reception. Unfortunately, you cannot turn the antenna up when the module tray is on. There are two little things that I don't like. First, the foam on the wheel is slippery. This doesn't really matter. I can replace the foam easily and it is not expensive. Mind you, the NB4 also has the same slippery foam and I replaced it too. The other thing is more serious. It doesn't have a rotary dial. If you are new to my channel, I normally do drifting. So I use the rotary dial to adjust the gyro gain. If I use the potentiometer, all the cars are going to have the same gain and that's not ideal. I know I can assign a trim switch to do the same thing and that's what I did in the tutorial too. But it's still not the same as the dial, isn't it? Anyway, they could make an expansion base for a dial or two and that's going to solve my issue. Welcome to HTX. HTX is the most versatile operating system to date. You can basically assign any input to do anything. But it is also the most user-unfriendly system I've ever come across. The trouble is, the air transmitter nomenclature and terminology don't translate well to surface applications. But that doesn't confuse me as much as the settings. There are many parameters that end up doing the same thing or are putting the same result. Here I have a diagram to show you how inputs can feed to each other and to the output. The parentheses are the terms that the HTX uses. If you normally fly, uh, these are not going to look very strange to you. But if you only drive surface vehicles, this is going to look quite daunting. Also, from a car transmitter user perspective, nothing is where it normally is. Everything is a sub-menu, within a menu, within another menu. Something that would take a few button presses on other transmitters will become a long process in HTX. For example, to set up a channel, you'll have to assign a physical input in the inputs menu. Then assign that input to the mixes of the channel that you want to output. EPA is in the channel within the outputs menu. But you can also limit the travel for each side from the inputs menu too. As I said earlier, this is not user friendly. But as long as you are willing to put in the time, it will work great. And there are infinite customizations that you can do. However, if you are looking for a quick setup, pick up and play type of transmitter, this is not it. The learning curve is steep. Even though I'm already familiar with HTX, it is still slower to set up a car than my ancient Futaba. It can do very complex mixing, but normally with a car, we just don't need to do that. Unless you have a vehicle with complex steering mixing, front and back steering, high gear and low gear, like a crawler, HTX is going to be very good for that. But rift cars and touring cars are not that complex, so it is going to be overly complicated for that. But still, the options are there if you need them in the future. Express Alaris is a protocol with amazing capabilities. You can change the packet rate to the highest and make it low latency. From my test, it has the same response as Noble NB4, which is amazingly fast. Or you can turn the packet rate down to increase the range, which will be beneficial for FPV driving. Personally, I like to make it as fast as possible because I don't run my cars further than I can see. But again, with it being an open source project, it comes with a lot of complications and procedures to get it working. You'll need a device with Wi-Fi to set up the receiver. Nowadays, everyone has a smartphone and you can use that too. 
you can change the output frequency on each channel, so you can match the frequency on the servo. You can change the channel output on receiver pins too. For example, you can output channels 1 and 2 on pins 4 and 5. Remember this feature, it will become important later. Also, you'll need to remember that you cannot use channel 5 to control anything. This channel is to tell the Express LRS system that the drone is armed, so it can only take either high or low value. If you want to use all the channels on the receiver, you can assign another channel to output on pin 5. This is where the channel pin swapping that I mentioned earlier comes into play. The Express LRS receivers are widely available from different manufacturers that make drone receivers. They come in different sizes and shapes, from compact to massive. As of now, there is no micro receiver with JST ZH plug yet. It is what we normally use in 120th and 124th scale. But if the ERS becomes popular with micro cars, I'm sure someone is going to make it. All receivers come with voltage sensor. If you connect it normally, it will read the voltage from the middle row. You can also connect the positive from the battery to the sensor port, and it will read the voltage from there. The receiver price varies from manufacturer to manufacturer, but they are relatively cheap, around 15 to 25 US dollars. I can even get one as cheap as 17 euros locally. You can buy the FCC version and flash it to LBT, so no need to worry about the version that you buy. You can just flash it to anything. Unfortunately, there is a problem with all the PWM receivers, which is this 3-pin system that cars and boats use. From the way it is designed, some channels will blast out the signal at startup. This can cause a problem with some servos, ESC and gyros that can be programmed through the S-Bus. This happens on the TX and RX pins on the receiver, these are the pins that we use for flashing the receiver. The one that's been confirmed to have the problem is the Futaba Acuvance. You'll have to use another channel or swap it to another pin. That is why I said earlier that the feature to change the channel pins is important. Unfortunately, it is tricky if you use free channel receiver because there is nowhere to move to. With all that being said, by the nature of open source, all the problems can be rectified quickly and things will improve. I'm very much looking forward to the next development of HTX and ELRS for surface applications. I have been using it both indoor and outdoor, and I'm happy to report that it feels great to use. The response is quick, and the signal never drops. In conclusion, all that radio master have to do is to provide us with a good hardware, and I can confidently say that they have. The wheel and trigger are extremely smooth and precise thanks to the Hall Effect sensor. Also, it's been many years since we last had a surface transmitter with module. It packs all the features for racing, like adjustable tension on the trigger and the wheel, and headphone jack. However, the software is still too complicated to operate, especially in a stressful environment such as racetracks. And if they decide to do a pro version or the next version of it, I demand a rotary dial or just replace a potentiometer with an encoder. How hard can that be? The ELRS version is as fast as Noble NB4 and the receivers are cheap. However, PWM receivers still have that compatibility issue with the SBUS components. For the 4-in-1 multi-protocol version, the receiver included has high latency. Personally, I'd say it is barely usable. I know because I have the 8 receivers too. They are quite slow to put it mildly. But if you get this version, you are most likely going to use it with your cars and receivers that you already have anyway. So that's not going to be a problem. No matter what you choose, you can install another module on it. So it all comes down to which system you use the most and choose the version according to that. Price per performance wise, it is the best right now. If you are okay with the complicated operating system, then it can do anything you'll ever need, and probably some more in the future. It is open source, so things can only get better from here. I also love how it comes with a carrying case, so I can take it anywhere safely. Now I have something to replace my edging Futaba 3PK for an outdoor transmitter. Finally, I want to say that this is a step in a new and exciting direction for surface transmitters and a good sign for the things to come. And that's it for this video. 
Thanks for watching and see you again next time. And there goes another review. I would be surprised if anyone is still here listening. Uh, this is quite refreshing, you know. Uh, it is great that Banggood is the one that sent this to me and not the radio master. So I didn't have to stay on the guideline and I could just say whatever the f I want. I'll keep using this transmitter because uh, actually I like it a lot. And I'll be posting more tutorials in the future. This is a really good product, but I feel like only the people from flying community care about it. Well, I can see why. Uh, with cars, we have the go-to brands like Futaba and Sanwa, and of course the Flysky Noble. And we can install any receiver to any car, so why bother, you know, with the HTX and everything. But I can also see that car transmitters are getting more and more expensive, with the, with the good features getting locked behind the premium ones. Uh, the air transmitters are way, way cheaper, with better features, like versatile operating system and Hall Effect sensor. Uh, it's a good time, it's a good time that these features come to car transmitters as well. Uh, that's everything, <laughs> that's, uh, well, that's, uh, well, I know this is the end, so that's everything I want to get out of my chest. Uh, I hope to see you again in the next video. Bye!